My name is Richard Vise. Welcome to this session on... It's about increasing healthy life expectancy as an example of inclusive growth in action. Uh, we're going to be running till, uh, till 12.35. The election campaign has been an all too predictable focus on health services and the, sort of the means of production of health, as it were, at the expense of an informed and creative discussion about health and how we create the conditions for health. There's been a mass of evidence, and indeed uh, much of it appeared in the recent CPP inquiry, about how social and economic forces such as poverty, crime, housing, uh, air quality and skills all shape our life chances when it comes to health and healthy living. But life expectancy improvements have stalled, and there seems to be some evidence in some parts of the country that's even regressing. Inequalities are widening, and we're still focused on the NHS picking up the pieces rather than how we create the conditions for good mental and physical health from the beginning of our lives uh, through to the end. So our expert panel today is going to be looking at how we can address these complex interdependencies between issues such as work, income, housing, the environment, poverty, and health. Uh, so there's going to be some short uh, presentations from, uh, from the, the chairs, and then we'll be opening up to uh, questions. So our first sort of scene-setting uh, speaker is Petra Meyer, Professor of Public Health at University of Sheffield. Petra, you're most welcome. Thank you, Richard. Being an academic, I have broad slides, which is uh, what, what academics like to hide behind. Um, I don't know whether you can see them. Guys, can we have some slides? So yes, uh, I'm a professor of public health in uh, at Sheffield University, as uh, as people have said, um, and we've recently started uh, an interesting new endeavour um, to look at what do we mean when we say health and well-being in all policies? What kind of research do we need? What kind of evidence do we need to support policy partners to do things differently? We've heard a number of times today the call for whole systems thinking, um, taking decisions differently, pooling budgets, reprioritizing what we do. Um, Stephanie mentioned we will have to think upfront much more than we ever have about the distributional impact of all that we do. This is where I think the field of public health in particular can make a major contribution together with a very multidisciplinary um, a group of people that I've tried to assemble to help us think this through. So very briefly, uh, what do we know? We know that the conditions in which we are born, live, work, age are majorly important uh, for, for health, uh, much more important than anything that healthcare delivery um, can ever do. Um, our director of public health in, in Sheffield says, well, health services can't buy back the health that is lost in other sectors. And I think that's, that sums up quite, quite right why we're inter so interested in social determinants of health. Um, we know that there is a massive uh, interdependency between health, work, income, productivity, um, which doesn't always get reflected in policy making. Uh, we know there are very, very stark inequalities in life expectancy and especially in healthy life expectancy, 20 years from richest to poorest areas in the UK. You know, this, this, this is someone dying at 45 instead of 65 or 65 instead of 85. It's, it's a lot of life that gets lost um, uh, because of those inequalities. Um, and we know that there is a very strong impact of economic well-being and financial stability at the individual level on, on health and mental health. So, having said all that, oh, works, yay. Um, why don't we have better evidence? And I, I ask you to trust me, the evidence really is not very good on uh, health and all policy approaches. Why don't we know what we need to do in terms of cross-sector activities to make the best impact on health and on all the other outcomes that we care about? As I say, health is determined by policies and sectors other than health, and we know that social policies have wide-ranging consequences. 
We know that. And we also know that there are complex causal pathways with indirect, independent and long-range consequences. And that's where it gets a bit tricky. It's just really, really hard to do. Health policy evidence at the moment often does not consider other sectors' interests. There are very few papers where you can see um, that, you know, if you do something on uh, a particular health issue, this is how it's going to affect productivity. Or this is how it's going to affect housing providers. Yeah, if I have a mental health program, loads and loads of NHS versus risk factors um, uh, um, a type of research, but very little that looks across sectors and produces the kind of evidence where you know if you do something here, this is the outcome across all different sectors that are relevant. Um, and appraisals and evaluations, as you will know, often have quite narrow sets of short term direct policy outcomes. Um, arguably missing most of the action that will accrue in places where, uh, as researchers, we fail to look. So then, obviously, the flip side is what's, what's needed. Um, at the policy level, creating the right conditions for cross-sector policy decision processes and the research to tell us what those conditions are, what, what's been tried, what has worked in other places. Can we learn from that in a, in a scientifically evaluated way? Um, how you move from a sort of health policy framing of, of things into a healthy public policy framing of things. Um, we need to know a lot more about the complex cause and effect systems at play um, to be able to find what the synergies and trade-offs are between different outcomes and be able to find the sweet spots that several people today have mentioned. Um, Arguably, we need much better data systems uh, to allow for real-time policy appraisal and evaluation, which allow us to monitor what happens across the whole range of outcomes. And we've heard a lot about metrics that we could use and so on. But at the moment, the data isn't quite there that would allow us to really look at the time when the policy is made at all the different things that might be happening in the system. We, we've got sort of, you know, annual data cycles, which you wait for another year before the data is available and so on. For policy purposes, that is very difficult. And even worse, when you go into research commissioning cycles, where you've got to apply for an evaluation, two years later, you've got the funding, then you need a, a year to set it, uh, the study up. By that stage, you know, you won't be able to collect the data from pre-implementation. So thinking about making the research landscape fit the policy landscape and the policy needs is important and a whole systems approach to policy effectiveness and cost effectiveness, not a sector-specific approach where you know, we, we look at individual outcomes. Uh, we need something that is much more looking at all the outcomes wherever they accrue. So just to uh, a quick plug, um, the, the funders, fortunately, research funders, have recognised that as a, as a main limitation of, of research. Um, uh, the UK Prevention Research Partnership is a, a partnership of 10 different health funders um, and, and have invested, um, I think, £40 million in total. Cypher is a new project that I'm leading, £5 million, five-year investment, bringing together a northern consortium of six universities, Newcastle, Manchester, Sheffield, um, uh, Leeds, and uh, Scottish uh, uh, Strathclyde and Edinburgh universities, deliberately so, um, the, the MIT of the north, maybe. Um, to, to look across areas uh, like non communicable disease, well-being in all policies, whole systems, economic evaluation, fairer society, social determinants of health, economics of prevention, all, all these kind of things, and bringing complexity science into it. So what will that look like? Um, we will um, try to understand the policy systems, uh, look at what cross-sector opportunities exist to, for policies, what the theory of change for these things is, what are the mechanisms that policymakers think might be at, uh, at action, and try to follow those through the system. What outcomes really matter to people? Not you know, what, what I, as a researcher, think is a, is a key outcome of a policy or a strategy, but what do people want to achieve? What are all the different things they're concerned about? What mutual uh, dependencies are there? So a qualitative uh, research uh, around the policy systems and then obviously what data metrics should we use, what is known already, can we create data infrastructures that are much more responsive to policy needs. 
um, then a lot of modeling is going to happen. You know, uh, we, we've heard from the, uh, from the sustainability research and how important that has been to put uh, climate change on the agenda for everybody. And it's now accepted that there are forecasts around what might happen to our climate that are, you know, whilst they're not point estimates, um, they, they are, you know, valid uh, ideas around what the most likely futures hold. This is the kind of thing that we want to do also for, um, for uh, policy options around inclusive growth. Um, we will ask people of how we should negotiate trade-offs between different outcomes, investing in housing, investing in inc uh, income equality, investing in, uh, in health services. You know, what is it that we should trade off and how should we do this? And how can we identify those synergies? Um, and then finally, economic models around the costs and benefits of investment and also of disinvestment decisions, given that we were heading for a recession or uh, m maybe we are. We heard, heard a lot about it earlier. We have to engage with how do we disinvest in a way that doesn't penalize the poorest the most. And then, you know, something around whether this is a sensible way to go. So just to thank funders and anybody who wants to know more than this very quick whistle stop tour of what our plans are. Uh, just get in touch, check out the website. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Petra. Our second speaker is Joe Bibby, the Director of Health at the Health Foundation. Joe. Great, thank you. Um, so, good morning. Um, for those of you that don't know the Health Foundation, we're an independent charity and we um, fund research policy work and improvement work to improve people's health and to improve health care across the UK. Um, but I wanted to start by asking a question. Um, so I'm going to ask you to put your hand up if you can tell me what is the life expectancy in the area where you work or live. So if you can tell me the life expectancy in the area where you work or live. That's great. Uh, um, good. Um, and keep it up if you can tell me the difference in life expectancy in the area where you um, work or live, great. And um, keep it up if you don't work in public health or the health sector. Great, okay, well, um, the reason why I wanted to uh, ask that question is because, as you'll have heard in the introduction there from Petra, and I'm sure through other parts of the morning, um, people's uh, social and economic uh, circumstances um, are the things that most shape um, how long they will live. And I live in Calderdale in West Yorkshire, and the average life expectancy for women in Calderdale is 82 years, 64 of which would be in good health, but 82 years in terms of life expectancy. That's about a year less than the na national average, and it's about three years less than the kind of the best, best life expectancy a woman could expect in the UK, for instance, if you were living in uh, Kensington and Chelsea. Um, and the difference in life expectancy between, uh, for women living in Calderdale is about nine years, depending on whether they live in the poorest parts of the borough or the most affluent. So if I wanted to be improving um, people's life expectancy in Calderdale, who would I go and talk to? Now, the kind of first answer might be, well, public health, of course. You know, they're the people who are concerned about this. They produce reports about this every year. Um, and, like, that would certainly be worth doing. I'm not dismissing that. But the reality is a lot of public health work is on the kind of more, um, that what they kind of directly commission and are responsible for are largely services and activities that are around reducing people's exposure to risk factors like tobacco or alcohol and sugar. Now that public health is in local government, actually public health now has the opportunity to start having conversations with people working across councils and local government. And that means they can start to have uh, conversations with people who are responsible for economic development or housing or sort of planning and licensing and so on. So they do now have the opportunity to start influencing um, those areas of work and start thinking about how can economic development um, start to improve people's life expectancy in their borough. But um, really, you know, and this is why I was so pleased to be invited here today, people who are working themselves on economic development really do have some very strong levers to be thinking about in terms of how they um, improve life expectancy. But, you know, is that going to be kind of your goal? Um, 
quite possibly not. And I think because actually not a great deal of you do know the life expectancy of where you live and work, that kind of tells me that's perhaps not something that's foremost in your mind. But really it is something that I think needs to start to become um, a shared responsibility for us. I, I love the quote about, you know, the health service can't buy back the years lost through other sectors, and that absolutely sums it up. And um, about two months ago, the Health Foundation published a report that's, that wanted to try and describe why do we need a whole government approach to improving life expectancy, to reducing health inequalities and improving health healthy life expectancy, because this isn't something that can sit with the Department of Health and Social Care, it's not something that could solely sit with the NHS, it can't solely sit with public health. It has to be a sort of whole sector response to this. And what, there's various things in the report that I'm not going to go into, but just for the context of this conversation and kind of how do we make health, improving health, a shared value for people working across different sectors? And there's three things that we talk about in the report. So, first of all, the need to value good health as an asset to the society and the economy. When you look at the conversation around health, it tends to be about ill health and it tends to be about the cost of ill health on the NHS and then usually why the NHS needs more money. Um, but what we think we need to be talking about is why good health is good for society, good for the economy and something that requires investment in. And one of the ways in which we think we can change the conversation to be more in line with that is if we had a more effective measure of you know, the health stock of the country or the health stock of a local area, something that sat alongside GDP as a measure of whether or not we're making the right investments in the right places. But the third thing we're very conscious of, and this is where I think there's a really interesting opportunity to learn from this audience, is that um, improving pe the population's health is a long-term thing. The investments, we know the investments we make in the first thousand days of life can shape um, children's, you know, what their future health outcomes might be 30, 40 years, 60 years down the line. Most of the planning, you know, for those areas of services are done on very short-term timescales, three years, say, at most. Um, but actually, I think there's something really interesting that people working in economic development are often working on much longer time scales when they're thinking about um, the benefit that's going to accrue from investments made. And so there's something about how can we start to apply some of that long-term thinking that happens in so some sectors and apply it in the sectors that we know are really important um, in terms of improving people's health. So um, that, I think, for us are the sort of three changes we would like to see at national level so that we create that kind of umbrella um, that can really put health as a shared value across all sectors. Great. Thanks very much, Joe. Our uh, third speaker is Michael Wood, who's the head of uh, Health Economics Partnerships at the NHS Confederation. Michael. Thanks, Richard. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to give a national NHS perspective, particularly around the issue of population health, which, which uh, speakers have referred to, and then look at it from the local prism, both within the NHS and perhaps from the local economy. Uh, the long-term plan, NHS long-term plan, almost a year old. It came out in January. And what it spoke about <coughs> front and centre uh, was this, this look at population health. So how can we, uh, the NHS, work with different partners in different ways to raise health outcomes and tackle inequalities for a given population? Uh, it also, of course, spoke about every part of England being an integrated care system by 2021. So what we have is a journey towards that more place-based uh, work across a given population of which the outcomes, health outcomes for that population are front and centre. Uh, so that was a quite a strong national message of a statement of intent. How does that get, mani get delivered and manifested itself in a process? So I sit on... Uh, NHS England's uh, Population Health Advisory Group, uh, which is bringing together quite a diverse mix. It's much wider than just the NHS, thankfully. Uh, it's only met once, so it's quite, you know, it's quite recent and we're still w working out quite what we do. But the critical aspects of the, its work, I think, will be to influence future policy. I think to look at the support these local systems need to understand what population health looks like, to look at the analytical capabilities, how to use data in different ways. I think to understand actually what targeted inventions might create and might raise better outcomes. And the last bit, which is the most important for me and my role particularly, is actually on how we connect to the wider policy debate. So how do we connect population health for you to through, viewed for the prism of NHS leaders to everything we're discussing today. And I think that's where, where my particular interest is. 
I would say perhaps at next year's CPP conference, judge the NHS nationally on the success it's made around population health in terms of its messaging, in terms of its focus, perhaps in terms of what it's asking its local systems to measure and develop. Two other things the long-term plan mentioned. One, of course, is NHS's anchor institutions, hugely welcome uh, and very positive uh, announcement. Perhaps we'll talk about that in the Q&A. And the other thing which has happened Martin, since... So could you just explain what an anchor institution is? Uh, a absolutely. So anchor institutions are large, spatially fixed organisations which have a social purpose and which therefore matter to the local economy. Uh, NHS, of course, is at universities, be some universities in the room, town hall, etc. So it's, it's about your relationship and your understanding and your impact in the local economy. We're still on a journey with that, but we'll, I'm sure we'll come back to that, Richard, at some point. The other thing which is of interest is the interim NHS People Plan came out in June. Workforce is, is the biggest challenge facing the NHS. Personal viewpoint on the NHS People Plan, actually there's a lack of real nuance about local labour markets and about the wider skills agenda which we will discuss today. Mm. So I think that's what you know a gap we're trying to close. But of course we can't do everything nationally, we shouldn't do everything nationally. It's, it's the local prisms I think which are particularly important. What I would say viewed locally is when I speak to NHS leaders, it's not just workforce which is now the biggest area of concern, it's also inequalities. And I think that's really a good positive sign in terms of the awareness amongst NHS leaders. It's still perhaps, I would say it's manifested itself in two ways. One way is that question about how do I as an anchor institution matter and what should I do? But it's also, uh, I think, manifested itself in an understanding that we can't be responsible for people's health and we shouldn't be working alone on this. So who, who and how do we do that? What we're not clear as yet, I think, when I speak to NHS managers and leaders, is what are the first, second and third steps they need to take to try and address this issue. And that brings us on to still the concept of the language of inclusive growth it still draws quite blank looks within the NHS. But population health is very similar concept, just viewed to that different end of the kaleidoscope in many ways. So conceptually we get it, but I think still, you know, the fact that we have to explain it to NHS leaders mean perhaps we're not uh, going as far and as fast with our relationships as, as we can. And, and what I would say on that, the, the last point there, is actually this is the bit where the NHS meets the local economy. So I advise a few local enterprise partnerships on the development of their local industrial strategies. And from the prism of the economic leaders locally, inequalities clearly matters, and much more than I would say than past strategic economic plans. You know, so we've got local enterprise partnerships seeing health and e inequalities as a key part of their plan. I'm doing some work in the Leeds City region, which uh, is, is where Joe lives, actually, so it'd be good to get you in involved in this, where, you know, where their local industrial strategy will have the main strap line, healthy lives that improve well-being and productivity. For everything we've discussed, people know that. And what's interesting there, of course, is how that then links to the work of the integrated care system, the NHS leadership coming together around that, what does an agreed local plan look like to tackle this issue? Well, it looks like good work, it looks like housing, it looks like climate, it looks like better shared resources, influencing of government collectively, the anchor institutions, it looks like holding big events where we bring the partners together. So we're getting that coming through in practice, uh, but, but it's still not everywhere. And conversations like today matter, but we need to get that into the mainstream NHS talk. And just briefly, who's providing the leadership on, on that in Leeds? Is it the City Council? Is it So, uh, in Leeds City Region, it's a local enterprise partnership. It's also a combined authority across West Yorkshire. Yep. So, the leaders of both a combined authority and a city region uh, and the local enterprise partnership. And then the uh, leadership of the integrated care system, which is an NHS chief executive and the wider leaders, so the voluntary sector, the business sector. So, it, sounds, it's, it's it does sound quite diffuse and complicated in terms of accountability. It's place leadership. Which, yeah. which I would say is, maybe come on to this in a conversation, inherently mm. complex, but that's not a reason not to do it. Yeah, indeed. Thank you very much. Uh, and finally, Shirley Kramer, the uh, Chief Executive of the Royal Society for Public Health. Thanks, Richard. I think I'll stand because I realise that I'm slightly blocked from, from view. Um, and my role uh, here today is to talk about local action and what's happening on the ground. And... Uh, and that's really an interesting piece of the architecture because it's different in different places and some places are a lot better than others, as you can imagine. If we have a healthy and happy population, then of course we're going to be more productive. And inequalities has been mentioned by my colleagues, but in reality what that means in many areas is that if you're in a deprived community in England right now, you are 
your children are two and a half times more likely to be obese and to have ill health ongoing through their life. And so we have a very unfair and unjust system. And I think one of the rather shameful things is that we have, apart from Malta, I think one of the worst inequalities in Europe on life expectancy and is one measure, but on many other measures around education, poor housing and other things. And one, one of the things I'd like to say in terms of economic growth and it truly being inclusive is that we need to target health and inequalities more generally across those social determinants of health. And what's happening at local level and who has that responsibility? Well, you heard Michael say this is a very diffuse system. We've made it really quite complicated on the ground. At RSPH, we talk about the public's health and well-being rather than public health. And what that means is in a local area, you will have the local authority responsible for people who and, and helping people who live in the area and the director of public health who's directly responsible for certain aspects of health and well-being. And the very best directors of public health are responsible across the piece and across working with colleagues across transport, education and other areas. They really, it's a joint enterprise across the council. So since 2013, local councils have had this responsibility and we have some areas of the country where this is working very well indeed. And in fact, local action and local excellence is better than things that are happening nationally. So almost despite some of the barriers we've heard about nationally, things not joining up, things on the ground. An example would be uh, in Wigan, which some of you will have heard about. What are the characteristics that make Wigan effective in making a more equal and a more inclusive situation? So the first thing is a shared vision locally. All elected members, the chief exec, leaders of the local football club, leaders, the police, the fire ambulance service are all in this together. Um, there's a strong collaborative leadership and a belief that that's the leadership um, that's going to work. Nobody, everybody has that same agenda. They're not um, arguing. This sense of uh, strong leadership also needs some support from more collaborative uh, funding and investment. We know that that funding sits in silos and often that, that stops things happening. Collaborative approach to commissioning is really important. And what they've done very particularly, as have Coventry and some other areas, they have worked and built on the strengths and assets of people who live in that community. So they have bothered to ask people in communities, what do you think is good for your health and well being? What would you like to happen? And they have allowed uh, and put money into local voluntary sector organizations to allow that to happen. So they have ceded power, which is one thing that I think um, Michael and I have certainly talked about this, that the NHS needs to cede some power and funding in order to make sure that communities can work better. They need to make sure that the frontline staff have the authority and the funding to get done what needs to be done because they all know. So it's training staff to have different conversations with service users, reinforcing this through all comms in a place-based local area, that geography. And we have some structures, you know, what are the structures that could help this? Well, the new primary care networks, the integrated care systems, we're so great at all these um, fancy names for things. But what that really means is that making things work together well on the ground. So if your granny is um, failing badly, but actually would really like to fail better at home and she needs a lunch club and she'd like to get her core strength up and go to a dancing class, that we can offer this locally. And that is happening in many of those areas. The NHS talks about a personalized agenda and that's what personalized agenda really means, that you get what you want. So the new social prescribing that uh, has been going on for a long time in lo local authorities, it's great to see in the NHS plan, social prescribing and link workers, thousand of them across local areas to help make this happen. So uh, I think my 
my thoughts on this are let's follow the best. We know where it's working. We know what could happen. We know how to make this happen. So let's take away those barriers, uh, both nationally and regionally, that are making this difficult for local areas uh, to move this forward. Because uh, we have loads and loads of great organizations in doing physical activity, arts and health, loads of uh, where you can signpost local people to, which is going to take care of them better than a pill and that will take that, uh, them away from their local GP practices and from the NHS eventually. So uh, if we all work together around that collaborative um, effort in local communities, we're going to see a real change in the local economy because you'll have a lot healthier people. Thank you. Thanks so much, Shirley. It's good to end on, on that note, it's about building the strengths and assets of a local community rather than doing stuff to them, which is, I think, why Wigan has caught so much of people's imagination. Now, I've got a few minutes for questions. Yes, uh, one, two, uh, oh, crikey, great. One, two, three, four. We'll take you together, please. Yep. Hi, I'm Francis. Yep. Hi, I'm Francis Brennan. Um, I haven't seen you for a while. Um, I work for an organisation called CTEC Plus, which is working in welfare to work. I'm also a non-executive director of Cornwall Niles and Silly Lep. Prior to that, I was vice chair of Heart of the South West Lep, so I'm a serial leper as well. Um, one of my frustrations is um, how do we join things up at strategic level, operational level and local level, but I'm particularly interested in two thoughts from the panel. One is how do we get this working much more effectively in a rural location? And Cornwall is it was one of the largest unitary authorities, but it's hell's own job to get it working in a rural economy. And the second one is, what can we do differently about helping the ageing workforce? Because we, and whenever we mention the ageing population as a grand challenge, we always mention care. And actually, I, you know, there are a lot of people that would want to work longer or have to work longer, so can we do something different with that? Thank you. Two great questions. Yes, please. Uh, hi, my very burning question is, you know, I go to these lot of medical seminars, etc., um, health seminars, and there's big talks about we need so much money in the NHS, in all the trusts, etc., but no one seems to tackle the big problem. Why are there varying procedures and processes in place which are absolutely different from one trust to another? So if I want to look up a patient's um, 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 medical record, I have to go through five different systems on my PC before I even get down to the patient's record. And that is totally unacceptable. That uh, delays uh, the, uh, the patient's time in the clinic, the consultant's time in the clinic, and every... Um, at every clinic, the consultant comes out tearing their hair out to think, where are the records? Great. So information sharing across the system, basically. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Peter Copelman. This isn't new, and there are so many parallels with climate change. Mm. 1992, Health of the Nation. Derek Wanless, 2004, yep. Yep. who was asked by the Chancellor of the Exchequer to cost for the health service and said he couldn't just cost for the health service, he had to cost for social services. What we need is a champion across government, and it is across government, because it has to be sustained. We won't see benefits for 15, <coughs> 30 years. We are told the long-term plan is going to be funded for five years, and then, of course, we get funding for one year. What we need is certainty for the longer term and an agreement how we're going to tackle this across the whole of government, both local and central. Thank you. And finally, next to you. Uh, uh, who, where was the fourth person? <coughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> I'm Greg Parston from Dartington Hall in Devon. Um, I'm really surprised that public health is beginning to be introspective again. Um, there's a, you know, there was a really big push in the 90s to try to set up a non-clinical public health association uh, that tried to incorporate the um, contributions of people beyond health itself. 
Um, I'm surprised that none of you are talking about marmot towns and what could be done locally to take the principles of tackling health inequalities to deal not only with health issues but broader environmental issues. From my friend from Cornwall in Totnes, we're trying to combine transition towns with marmot towns to take a look at how environmental sustainability can, and can just say in two in can just world. say in like six words what, I, um, what Michael Marmot was referring to. So. Marmot, marmot, uh, was, marmot towns are towns that, uh, Sheffield is a good example, Coventry another, of towns that are trying to adhere to the principles that Michael Marmot put forward in tackling health inequalities in, in his report. Great. Transition towns are towns that are trying to become self-sustainable environmentally. If we combine those, we break out of the bl blinders of public health and we begin tackling environmental issues and health inequality issues simultaneously. Brilliant, thank you very much. So um, the questions there are how do we join services up, not least in a rural, ro rural location? Think about the aging workforce, not just uh, aging care. Sharing information, of course. Um, certainty in long-term policy. I mean, heaven knows it's difficult to imagine that at the moment, isn't it? Um, Michael Marmot Towns and, and environmental um, sustainability alongside uh, good health. So, um, Joe, let's start with you. Yeah. So uh, pick and choose yeah, as you wish. Uh, a couple of those that I'll um, pick up on then. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think hopefully what I was reflecting in what I said was the need for taking a long-term view on how we improve health. And one of the things that we've talked about in the report that we've published is having some kind of commissioner. So in Wales, there's a future generations commissioner who is sort of holding wider government to account to ensure that they do more long-term thinking. And I think there's definitely a need for some sort of role and some independent body that does provide advice to the English government and challenge and hold to account the English government on whether it really is investing for the long term. Uh -uh. Some of the analysis we've done in this report looks at how budgets are changing and we're seeing that even though budgets are falling overall, worse than that, more is being spent on kind of acute need and less on the prevention side of things. So that's just storing up problems for the future. On Greg's question, I'm not sure I quite followed it because I thought what I was saying was exactly that, that public health in local government has the opportunity to work across the whole of local government and sort of wider structures locally, as um, uh, Shirley was describing. And absolutely, there's lots of places that are doing that. And indeed, the Health Foundation is working with Michael Marmot to produce a report that will be published in March looking at 10 years on from his original report. So I think that's exactly where public health I think, I think So I think our questioner was worrying that perhaps some of that momentum towards the wider causes is being lost and public health well, is sort of lapsing back you, a little. You, you don't no, see that happening? No, I think um, public health really are on this case. Yeah. Great, okay. Petra. Yeah, man, I think, uh, you know, uh, pu public health itself, where, wherever we go um, <coughs> as researchers, are very keen to branch out and make it not about health policy, but about healthy places mm -hmm. and all that is needed to make a place a healthy place and to understand how the mac macroeconomic conditions and the local level drivers of health um, act together to, um, to, you know, create inequalities and what, you know, what is the most sensible thing to do first, given that you can't do everything, how should you weight up different things that you could be doing, a universal basic income or anchor institution stuff or uh, improving housing or improving work accessibility first. So what, what, you know, how do you wait between different priorities um, in order to get the best uh, bang for the buck in a way? And how do you make sure these things are aligned in a way, if you do many different things, that you don't waste precious resources by doing things that counteract each other in effect? And that's... You know, that seems a sensible thing to do, but in practice, it's really hard to predict how your housing and your welfare reforms and your other reforms might be, inter uh, you know, what the interplay might be in order to, uh, you know, not, not inadvertently introduce things that have got negative consequences. And I think that's where, hopefully, um, a lot of the thinking is, is gearing up to be a lot more wise in terms of the alignment of different things that um, a, a strategy at a local level can uh, can achieve. Sh Shirley, in your reply, can you shed any light on the issue about um, rural population mm. health? We, we, we think about towns and cities yeah. and so forth, and it's often missed. It is, and um, I'm from Cumbria, so I, I totally get it. And my parents were alive. I was constantly worried um, about their, everything to do with their care and, and welfare around that. One of the big issues is transport. 
and uh, Cornwall and Cumbria have the same problems. We've got less buses, less public transport. There really needs to be a look at the infrastructure uh, around transport. Uh, employment, and I've been sitting as a food farming countryside commissioner, and we've been looking at rural employment. That's uh, very important. We need to keep our young people there. Uh, the other thing uh, around that is, in, certainly in Cumbria, there's one major hospital now in the whole county, so there really need to be some smaller uh, clinics. There's also, um, how do we, the aging workforce, I know it was something you uh, talked about. We've developed something called Young Health Champions. This is to give young people some idea, peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning. But from that, we're developing sort of career pathways. Are you interested in joining the community health social care workforce because we're not telling young people what the potential roles are in your community or in your and there are loads of new jobs going to become available if this vision of the future happens there'll be different kind of roles available and we are not doing enough to talk to young people about that and because it is a real worry around uh, workforce thank you and finally michael can you pick up the point about uh, about joining up services mm. Yeah, and, and joining uh, up policy and strategy as well. Yeah, I, th I think there's a, there's a there's a white hole level. I mean, you see this with devolution. There's there's a, there's a break in the circuit, which is the health. Where is devolution in the conversations about about actually the economy, about local economies, about how we work together across across pieces? So I think the Department of Health or or the NHS national bodies are not in the room when we're actually talking about what local strategy looks like. In terms of some of the points about variation in, in practice, I think as these place-based systems come together, governance and how we work will be a critical part of that. I'm more worried about variation in outcomes and variation in, in actually how we work, which I think, but, but you know, so there's, there's on the ground, what we should see as a patient, but uh, in terms of strategy, place-based strategy, we need nationally to be practicing what we expect for each local. Yeah, and the NHS is a long way from getting that message, isn't it, and, and working with local authorities and others. Uh, Adam Lent from the uh, New Low Government Network described um, how there was a community-shaped hole at the heart of a long-term plan. <laughs> and I think a lot of people in, in local government uh, saw a lot of resonance in that <coughs> remark. So that's all we've got time for, I'm afraid, folks. A bit of a, bit of a, a rapid canter around the course, but can I thank our four speakers, uh, Petra Meyer, Joe Bibby, Michael Wood and Shirley Kramer for their contributions. Thank you.